Several years ago Oxford, England there was a policy in the British government to make overtures to physics students from countries like North Korea, Iran, Russia and China who attended their prestigious universities like Oxford. Wakanda made it to that list of countries because of the secrecy around the country. When T'Challa enrolled, bells and whistles were sounded in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And a team was sent to the Oxford Physics Department on Keeble Road. T'Challa was in his second week at the university when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs team approached him on campus. The 18-year-old Tichala was called from his class and sent to a private room where he met two representatives from the ministry. They identified themselves as Earl Smith and Adam Peters. They offered Tichala a chair and they sat in separate chairs that were flanked by their brown briefcases. The atmosphere was semi-cordial. Tichala did not have the enhanced senses or peak human form, but he was highly athletic and combat trained. Academically he was ahead of his class and was the only one on the advance program that would see him receive a doctorate in half the time it normally took. The 40-year-old Earl Smith was of African descent and T'Challa assumed that he was sent to put him at ease. In fact, Smith did most of the talking. What is this about? asked T'Challa. We are here from the foreign office to offer our corporation to you, replied Smith. Why would I need your cooperation? You can never know, things that may occur in the future can be smoothed out because of the mutual relationship between you and Great Britain, replied Smith. I see, said T. Chella. I understand that your father was the leader of Wakanda, said Smith. So who is in charge, asked Peters in quick succession. My uncle, replied T. Chella. I don't know what kind of a relationship that you have with him, but we are available if you go back and wish to take over, said Smith and he let the sentence linger. T'Challa understood that the offer of military backing for a coup was placed on the table. There is also a monetary consideration for you, said Peters. Okay, said T'Challa, as he recognized the scheme. What do you want in return for helping me? Information on military projects like nuclear missiles, responded Smith. Oh, said T. Chella. We will give you time to think about it, said Smith. And it would be advisable to keep this amongst ourselves, said Smith. Of course, said T. Chella. But I will not need your assistance. At least think it over, said Smith and he rose. I will not. I find it disrespectful for you to come here and try to bribe me, said T'Challa. This is not a bribe, said Smith. This is a part of foreign relations. As you get older you will realize how vital such arrangements can be. Smith and Peter left while an angry T'Challa returned to class, and he lost his concentration for the rest of the day as he could not believe the gall of the British government. He carried his silent rage to his dorm room where he met Abraham Hunter and Jeremy James. They were on the same floor and spoke to him occasionally. They invited T'Challa to a party in the city. T'Challa agreed to ease his mind. Abraham Hunter studied history and James majored in psychology. They were 20 and 19 years old respectively and came from wealthy families like the majority of the other students. James brought three girls along for the night out. Not that T'Challa was looking forward into delving deeper into the experience. The group travelled in James' car as T'Challa and Hunter left theirs at the dorm. The party was in a flat on Washburn Street in Oxford City. Students from the university were the main occupiers of the medium-size abode. The DJ played techno music and beers, cigarettes and cannabis were ubiquitous. T'Challa leaned up against the wall as one of the girls danced next to him. Soon the cigarette smoke and monotonous music caused him to head outside. James and Hunter were unaware of his departure. He decided to walk around the block. It dawned on him that the British government might be following him so he looked suspiciously at everyone he met on the sidewalk. He memorized every car that passed him. 
Suddenly he heard the roar of car engine as it sped along the street, then it screeched to a halt in front of a Chinese young man who looked like a student and he had been walking alone on the opposite sidewalk. Three men erupted from the car and they grabbed the young man and attempted to drag him into the car. Hey, stop that, shouted Tichella. He shot forward and ran to the car. One of the men tried to block him. Tichella timed his run and then delivered a high kick into the man's chest. The man fell back and collided with another kidnapper. The last one came at Tichella and he blocked a wild fist and jammed a bladed hand into the man's ribs. The man held his side immediately and Tichella smashed a hard right hand into the man's face and the assailant fell. The Chinese student ran off. Stop, said Tichella. The student ignored his call and he continued to run for dear life until he was out of sight. Three cars stopped near the scene and the drivers offered assistance. One of the Good Samaritans offered to call the police. Meanwhile, Tichala secured the three men and checked for identification documents. Only the driver was identifiable and he was a British citizen. The police sirens brought out the residents of the apartment flats. Tichala was certain that James and Hunter would be concerned. He really did not want to speak with them at the time because his concentration was on the incident. One police car arrived and two officers alighted from it. The first thing Tichala noticed was that the officers were not armed. They inquired from Tichala and the helpers on what occurred whilst they checked on the attackers. The officers deemed that the men needed medical attention and they called dispatch for an ambulance. Then one officer asked Tichala a few questions about the fight and he related the events. Did you see the person who ran away before? asked the officer as he wrote in his notebook. No. It was the first time, replied Tichala. How about the attackers? asked the officer. The same thing. Do you live around here? I'm a foreign student at the university. Okay said the officer. We may come by the university to ask a few more questions. That will be fine, said Tichella. And thanks for the help, said the officer, and he flipped the cover of the notebook to close it. The ambulance came ten minutes later followed by five more police cars and the officers controlled the crowds as the perpetrators were prepared for the hospital. Everything passed by like a blur to Tichala from that moment to when he returned to his dorm room. The girls asked him a multitude of questions. James and Hunter wished that they had been there to throw a few punches at the bad guys. Then everyone scratched their heads as they tried to remember any Chinese students on campus. Tichala realized that the girl named Candace was fond of him. She held his arm as they entered the dorm. James and Hunter knew what was up and peeled off with the other girls. I think that I like you, said Candace. Tichella untangled himself from her to maintain his self-control since she was attractive. Maybe we can go out again, said Candace. Tichella looked down at her round face, long auburn hair and high healthy breasts. Actually I'm on a tight class schedule. I only took this night out as a one-off. I see, said Candace. Well if you ever reconsider my number is Tichala listened to the number and forgot it at the same time. Candace eventually left him and he headed for his room. And despite the action that had occurred in the city, he was still peeved by the ministry's visit. So Tichala was glad when he finally got to close his dormitory door to the world. His room was in darkness. Then Tichala sensed that someone else was present. Who is there? asked Tichala confidently, and he clenched his fists tightly. Turn on the lights and see, said a strong male voice. Tichala flipped the switch and it revealed a strange image. A man attired in a uniform that had the colors and pattern of Great Britain's national flag sat in a chair with his arms folded and one leg on the knee. I'm Union Jack, protector of the United Kingdom, said the man, and he stood. 
He was six feet and three inches tall and carried two pistols on both sides of his belt. He had an athletic build and presence. His bizarre uniform concealed his face. Why are you here? asked Tichala, unfazed. To deliver a message, replied Union Jack in an accent mostly used by common people in England. You stopped a kidnapping tonight the Chinese kid ran off so I don't know what happened to him after that, said Tichala. He's not Chinese. He's Taiwanese, corrected Union Jack. And he is the nephew of a very rich and powerful man from that island. The people who tried to grab him are a part of the cross gang. They will be looking for you. Where is the kid now? asked Tichella. I got him, replied Union Jack. I was monitoring him from the shadows. When I was about to make my move to save him, you appeared. I caught up to him soon after. So what is your message? Be on the lookout for the cross gang. They don't like interferences, said Union Jack, and walked over to the window. Tichala guessed that was how he broke in. How do I even know that you are authentic, said Tichala. You just have to trust your instincts bloke, said Union Jack. And how did you even find me, asked Tichala. I work for the government, replied Union Jack. Do the math. He opened the window and jumped out to the side. Tichala rushed to the window and peered out. By that time, Union Jack had scampered up to the roof and disappeared. A rush of blood passed through Tichala's veins. He was not going to give a street gang the chance to attack him. He went to his belongings and got a kamoyo. He called the Wakandan spy station in London for information on the cross gang. The spy station operated in London for a hundred years. The station even prevented an assassination attempt on William Wilberforce during the Hydra Wars when Wakanda was at war with the organization. The station provided the location of the gang's leader which was in London. Tichala got ready for a preemptive strike on the gang. He went through his clothes and selected a black combat training outfit. Eight minutes later, he was in his car headed for London. Chapter 2 The bright London skyline dazzled in the falling rain as Tichala looked across to the gang leader's penthouse apartment. Tichala stood on a hoverboard that he took from the spy station. The thin circular board had anti-gravity plates underneath and it was steered by the weight of the rider on the front, back and sides. As Tichala stood in the center of the board the device kept motionless. Tichala pondered on exactly how he would strike the penthouse. He was not sure where the bedroom for the leader was else he would go directly there. He assumed that numerous bodyguards lined the inner rooms. He needed to be swift to take out all the guards and gather the leader. Hello chap, out for a night spin, said a familiar voice. Tichala turned around and looked onto the roof of the building that he was next to. A soaking Union Jack was standing there. Tichala wore a mask so he doubted that Union Jack recognized him. Union Jack continued, By the look of it, you plan on crashing in Packer, said Union Jack. Packer was the gang leader. Tichala remained silent and wondered why Union Jack was there. You may very well start a gang war by taking on Packer, more bloodshed in the streets said Union Jack. Tichala knew he was correct. Organized crime was like a hydra and the gang members were stupid reactionary fools. Why don't we go have a beer, said Union Jack, and take our minds off of Packer. I don't drink, said Tichala firmly. Surprise burst from Union Jack's eyes. You, he said. Yes, it's me, said Tichala. He shifted his weight and the hoverboard flew over Union Jack. Where did you get the tech? asked Union Jack. It's classified, replied Tichala while the board lowered onto the roof. What are you doing here? Stake out, replied Union Jack. I assume that you want to attack them before they have a chance to come at you first. 
correct, said T. Chela. I read from your file that you are royalty, said Union Jack. What else is on my file, interrogated T. Chela with a disdainful stare. Uncooperative, said Union Jack slowly. That makes this conversation a bit one-sided since I don't know anything about you, said T. Chela. Okay, said Union Jack. I was born in a working-class family so I really don't like royalty. I ended up meeting some national heroes and became Union Jack. I'm also a Pendragon Knight. Pendragon? You know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, said Union Jack. Never heard of them, said Tichella. What about Excalibur? Those things are meaningless to me, said Tichella. I don't believe that. Everybody in the world knows King Arthur. I don't. What makes him so special? He stood for truth, honor, valor and defense of the weak, replied Union Jack. Have you ever heard of Bashanga? No, can't say that I have. He had the same values as your King Arthur. Did he form a nation like Arthur did Britain? asked Union Jack triumphantly. Yes. He united Wakanda and founded the nation, replied Tichella. Do you want to carry on with this contest? Actually I want to get out of the rain, said Union Jack. Seeing that it is always raining in England you should be used to it, said Tichella. And tell your government to leave me alone. Very well chap, said Union Jack. As long as you stay away from Packer. Besides I can build a case on him if tries to go for you. I can protect myself, said Tichella. Ah the pride of youth, said Union Jack. Tichella turned away and prepared to leave. And another thing, said Union Jack. Thanks for helping the kid. Don't mention it, said Tichella, and he shot up to the sky. T. Chala returned to Oxford University and he was never bothered by either the British government or the cross gang again. Therefore, T. Chala returned to the real reason for attending the university. Ulysses Claw, the man who assassinated his father gained a doctorate in physics at Oxford. T. Chala wanted unfettered access to the university's records on Claw so he would have a comprehensive understanding of the man he intended to kill. Not even his mother knew of the scheme.